and first, I just want to thank the U.S. Embassy Office of it's not here to get my face. Anyway, the U.S. Embassy Office of Public Affairs is the um, office that has continued to provide us with these um, with with this series of speakers over the past few years, and so we're grateful to the uh, embassy for doing this. We're grateful for Dr. Kinzer um, for his trip to Egypt. Um, it's a five-day tour around the country. He'll be in Alexandria tomorrow, also the next day, and so forth. So it's a very uh, quick tour, but uh, we're grateful for you being here. Um, so we'll just, just get started on the lecture right now, and um, then we'll have some opportunity for questions and discussion later on. So Kevin? Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation to come here. It's my first time in Egypt. I've wanted to come to Egypt for a long time, so I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to so and talk with you. Today. I was asked to talk about rankings, uh, and so I titled the talk Quality, Innovation, and International Rankings Defining World Class Universities in Egypt. And the reason why I did it that way is because I think these are three components that are really necessary. This, this triad, so to speak, of quality, innovation, and rankings really do make for what a world class university is. And I wanted to emphasize those three roles um, going in. Let me first talk just a little bit about myself and where I come from the perspectives that I'm taking on this so that you understand a little bit more about who I am and, and why I come to it from the perspectives that I do. I am a professor of education policy at Penn State, Pennsylvania State University in the United States, where I'm also the department head for the Department of Education Policy Studies there. Uh, my research focus is on the internationalization of higher ed, so looking at how universities build their inter international capacity as they work towards improving their programs of study. And in particular, I've had a focus over the last number of years on developing international branch campuses. So I really think about this notion of how international intersects with local and regional issues in a really deep way. I, I also, another interest that I have is on private higher education and the growth of private higher education around the world. So I'm familiar with institutions like AUC and others that are looking to work in a different model than the typical state-sponsored institutions that are in those countries. So that's kind of a background of what I do. The other thing that I want to say is I am at Pennsylvania State University, which is generally considered to be a top 100 university in the world. And I am uh, head of a department that has three programs, a uh, program in education policy, another in education administration, and another in higher education administration and leadership, all three of which are ranked in the top 10 in the United States for those programs. So I'm very familiar with how rankings and how important rankings are in the way that we operate and the benefits that, that I gain from being at a highly ranked institution with highly ranked programs in my department. But that said, I often tell people that we can have great debates, even as I'm bragging about how uh, we have the, uh, these highly ranked programs, and it's featured prominently on our website, to, to be sure. I tell people, it's like, well, that that's really doesn't, we don't really know what that means in terms of what the quality is. I know about the quality because I'm there every day working on the issues of quality. Uh, and it's that quality that I think is most important in what's coming forward. Uh, so before I get into the, the, the meat of the lecture, I just want to see if there's any, any pressing questions that people have right now that I can make sure that we uh, have this be uh, an, an interactive conversation. Are there questions about the rankings here at AUC or efforts that you think are underway here that you would like me to speak to uh, in, the, in the course of this conversation? I always have a problem that ranking doesn't include quality of teaching. Yes. And uh, that's the big, you know, for, for our students, uh, quality of education is really what they're getting in their class. That is, that is an excellent point, and I'll just skip over that slide then when I get to it because we're talking about it now. I, I think one of the issues, in fact, let me. When we talk about world-class universities, we're really talking about um, a, a set of universities that have particular kinds of characteristics associated with them. And one of the first characteristics is they're focused on research. Right? Now, there, there's instruction that happens and teaching that happens. But really, the area that these global rankings and world-class universities are known for is not their quality of undergraduate instruction. It's for the quality of their faculty in terms of the research productivity that they have. And so that's an important element that when we talk about this, we're really looking at only a, a segment of this. We're also looking at institutions that have a culture of excellence so that they are, 
They design themselves so that they maintain this sort of excellent position and present themselves that way. Uh, they have great facilities, great laboratories, great classrooms, um, and they have a brand name that's recognized for quality around the world. Um, so these are important elements. But really, the, the key thing is that they are in the top tier of the world rankings. If you have all of these components associated with them, but you're not in the ranking system, then it's difficult for people to consider your institution a, a world-class institution. Um, but you notice that you're absolutely right. The instruction is not a part of it. And even in the rankings, and you'll see later on when we go through some of the criteria for the rankings, even in the rankings where they mention instruction or quality of teaching, they're using metrics that really aren't getting at the heart of what we think they are, what we think institutions should be doing. Um, so I actually challenge this notion of world-class university as being as comprehensive as it makes itself out to be. Because it's even more narrow than this. It's even more narrow than what we see right here. What we're really looking at is a universities that are focused on research, but research in the sciences, right? So humanities is, uh, is, is undervalued in this. Social sciences are undervalued in this model. We're looking at research in the sciences in particular. We're looking at institutions that have a long history, that have been around for a while, that have been able to build up this sort of reputational measures. They're, they're known around the world. Most of them teach at least some of their programs in English, so there's a language component to it, uh, that uh, a uniformity of language that comes into play. And some of the rankings you'll see actually specify English language as one of the criteria that they're looking at in their rankings. Uh, the world rankings were built for these institutions, not the other way around. These institutions aren't defined by the world rankings so much as the world rankings are defined by these institutions. So they're lucky from that perspective. If you designed your own ranking system that did not have Oxford and Harvard and, and California Institute of Technology at the top, the flaw would be in the ranking system, right? It wouldn't be in the institutions identified. People wouldn't believe that the rankings were legitimate because it didn't come up with those institutions that everybody knows should be at the top of the list. So we're looking at this subset of institutions that's associated with this here. Um, other kinds of questions that I might be able to tap into right now? You're doing a nice job so far of helping me walk through this presentation in a nice, consistent way. Do you have something, sir? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, so another aspect that I want to make sure that we talk about is these new realities that are facing higher education and how these new realities are influencing how we consider the operations of universities. Um, the first thing is just a, a blanket statement that change is happening. And it's, it's often uncomfortable, the kind of change that we're dealing with now. We have institutions, we have uh, influences on institutions now that are making, that are having us uh, in, include aspects in our education programs that, that are, are difficult to reconcile with the traditional way that we've done higher education in the past. Um, and in places where faculty have been around for a long time, they might look at these new pressures and have some, some, some concerns about how they spin into place. Um, another aspect that we're dealing with is there's really no such thing as a local aspect to higher education anymore without also including the global. In fact, we've coined a new word to represent this global, um, the combination of the global and the local in education. Um, quality is another thing. It's no longer assumed. We don't have this assumption that higher education is quality just because we say so. It's the kind of thing that needs to be evaluated, assessed, and, and, and um, validated. Um, education is a public good. Education is still a public good, but it has very significant private benefits associated with it. And these private benefits lead to a private investment and private sector involvement in education that is, is almost universal now. Um, so I'm talking not just about private higher education, like institutions like yourself, but all sorts of private companies and corporations that are providing services to higher education and, and helping them in different sorts of ways do the kind of activities that we might informally consider to be core functions of the university itself. Uh, well, there's examples of institutions providing a curriculum for higher education institutions in uh, online formats and those sorts of things that the institutions couldn't do it themselves. There are international um, recruiting programs that draw students to campuses, recruit international students, bring them to campuses, provide infrastructure and support for those students to be successful language training and the like. 
even a basic system like a bookstore that used to be something that was fundamentally run by the university as part of its academic enterprise, now in the United States at least, is largely outsourced to major companies and corporations. So there's a, there's a lot of these kinds of aspects that you have this, this um, panoply of peripheral uh, organizations, often for profit, that are running and helping institutions in higher education. The final aspect is technology, and we've all heard the stories about technology being disruptive, but what I think is important about it with higher education is that it's not just disruptive in terms of what we're doing, it's actually fundamental and foundational to what we are doing right now. We couldn't do the kinds of higher education programs and um, activities and research without the assistance of technology. I think that's a fundamental component of what, what we're doing. So these are sort of the new realities of higher education that we're functioning under. Um, let me skip that and just go straight to endemism in higher education. So endemism is a term from biology that refers to organiz organisms that are native to or dependent on a particular uh, environment, a particular physical environment that they, they evolved to be uh, supported in, that, that this is the environment that they're native to. Uh, that it's important for them to remain in that notion. But we also know that higher education has similar kinds of characteristics to it as well. Most institutions were founded in a particular geopolitical environment, a particular regulatory environment that they are designed to be part of. Uh, many of these institutions have the name of this location as part of their name. So American University in Cairo, right? It's part of the name that it's, it's grounded here in Egypt and it's reflective of the Egyptian system and traditions and culture. So, but higher education, when it moves outside of these environments, is becoming what I call non-pandemic. It's operating outside of its natural environment. And when we have an organism that's outside of its natural environment, it either needs additional support in order to survive, light, air, uh, uh, different types of food, protection from pests, or it is so able to compete, outcompete the native things that it becomes an invasive. And when I look at higher education moving into these new environments, I wonder to what extent are these global universities actually acting in an invasive kind of quality and serving uh, to the detriment of the local institutions that are there that they're not able to compete with. So it's an important aspect to think through what's, what happens with the, or, with the organization as it leaves its community, what happens in the location away. But it's also important to say, well, what happens to the home location and how is that impacted by these activities as well. So what we have is a multinational university with non-endemic academics as part of it. And just like we have multinational corporations, there's a, uh, an entire regulatory, transnational regulatory infrastructure that supports them. We're in the process right now of developing that transnational regulatory infrastructure to support the multinational university. You might not know it, but it's happening all around us right now with higher education and trade, with, uh, with transnational quality assurance systems, with harmonizing of systems between countries, with common higher education areas that are developing in ways that can support uh, the, the common transfer and participation of higher education across national boundaries. It's still in its nascent stage right now, but that's the direction that we're heading. This also leads us to what, what has been referred to as an internationalization imperative. So this is the idea that institutions must look internationally for what they're doing and how they're performing. They must look at it from a scholarly perspective because science and scholarship is not limited by national borders. The, the, the pursuit of truth is the same here as it is in the United States as it is in any other part of the world from a scientific perspective. From an educational perspective, we want the cultural competencies that are important in an interconnected global economy. From a financial perspective, there are different revenue streams and financial sources that can be drawn on internationally that might support institutions, particularly in countries that are having declining rates of support from the state. And then finally, from a globalization perspective, as everything becomes more globalized, the idea of higher education fundamentally in connecting places and cultures across borders becomes increasingly central to the way higher education operates. Uh, internationalization as a concept, this is a, a, a chart from the American Council on Education which developed the idea of comprehensive 
internationalization. So it's an idea that what, what internationalization is doing is not just things that happen outside and away, but it's a way to influence what goes on on campus as well in terms of the mission of the institution, in terms of the leadership and staffing of the institution, uh, the curricular components of the institution. So, so the, there's internationalization at home through an internationalized curriculum. Uh, faculty uh, 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 hiring processes and promotion processes uh, include international components to it as well. Uh, student mobility, of course, and oftentimes this is the most uh, critical aspect of it for institutions. How many students of theirs are studying overseas? How many international students do they have on their home campus? And then collaboration and partnerships, which is the, the recognition that if we're going to do the best work possible, we're going to work with the best people possible, we need to develop partnerships and collaborations with organizations and entities in the around the world. So I'll just talk about quality assurance because that's the first of my tri 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 triad here in terms of developing a world-class university. And I focus on the quality aspect because I really think that's the fundamental. That's where most of our attention should be put, put into. Uh, that the idea that if we're designing our programs to be of high quality, then they, we are going to be satisfied with them and be able to promote them to students. Um, irrespective of how that might then look in terms of what outside evaluations are put forward. So thinking about quality from that perspective. There's this quality assurance has been going on for over 100 years. There's been ongoing tension in its implementation, uh, particularly when you have outside individuals dictating to universities what it is that they should be doing. Um, the focus, though, is on these national systems and individual institutions. So each nation develops its own quality assurance system uh, and develops it uh, often in part of this realm where they're considering what is going on in other countries, but designing a system that is inherent for the country that they're operating in. Um, it's necessary now for a modern education system to have a quality assurance model in place. Um, just about every country now has something along these lines, and most institutions understand that it's their obligation to work within an internal quality assurance system. There's a tension between trust and accountability in these two ideas. So if we are nobly fulfilling the public mission, right, there's a lot of trust associated with what higher education is doing. If we act primarily out of self-interest, then there demands much more accountability in the system. And this leads us to this idea of external and internal quality assurance that comes into play here. So from an external perspective, that's the accountability question. Institutions can't be relied on to act properly on their own, so there needs to be, that they're mistrusted, so to speak, so there needs to be coercion associated with it. And the idea of quality is defined by these um, outside stakeholders that come into play with it as well. Um, contrast that, or partner that is probably a better word, with an internal quality assurance metric that makes it clear that institutions of higher education want to get better and are working uh, uh, daily in order to improve their systems in, from an intrinsic motivation of quality improvement associated with it. So this comes from an, an idea of trust, and the idea is not coercion, it's incentives that are being provided so that people act in different sorts of ways. And so this idea of external and internal quality assurance, in my mind, the internal quality assurance is where the bulk of our attention should be placed. Designing those policies and procedures within our institutions to help achieve the best possible outcomes given your mission. So we have different aspects of quality. So the first one is fitness for purpose. The idea that the purpose is defined by the people sitting in this room right now who understand what kinds of students we're trying to serve, what sort of mission we're trying to pursue right now. And it's not measured by hierarchy or rankings of prestige. Rather, it's by this purpose that's internally determined by an institution. And to the extent that the institution meets that purpose, it's considered a high-quality institution. Um, another view of this is its fitness of purpose. So there's a purpose that's externally determined, sort of a public mission, a public purpose, that society says we want higher education institutions to fulfill. So it's quality for the public good, and it's for the benefit of society as a whole. Uh, it's the idea that the benefits from higher education are greater to society than they are for any single individual. 
and the idea of this, this form of purpose, what is it that society expects from higher education, is externally generated um, and defined. Now, there might be, and there often are, strong partners and support for that external purpose on campus itself, but it's a different sort of purpose because it is assigned to an institution of higher education by society. That often comes through legitimacy, questions of legitimacy. What does an institution of higher education look like? How is it designed? It's no accident that most institutions of higher education look very similar to one another and have a similar sort of structures and programs and curriculum and those sorts of things because a legitimate institution of higher education has a particular kind of look to it. There's a, a, a practical value that constituency has uh, that it ascribes to the institution itself. And the institution is seen as doing the right thing, that higher education is fundamentally altruistic in this model. Even if it's a private institution, a for-profit institution, it's designed for the sort of altruistic, right purpose according to society, rather than for the benefit of its owners or managers or other kinds of entities. It's an important aspect of a legitimate higher education, that it's not a, a business like any other business, but it's a business with a particular mission or service associated with it. So this leads to several kinds of questions that we might ask about the quality assurance model that we have on our campuses or in our countries. So what is the purpose? What purpose should the quality assurance mission serve? What, what are its goals? What is it trying to accomplish? Thinking about who should be its constituents, who are the beneficiaries of this model. Thinking about how much power should an external quality assurance agent have and be able to determine what are the actions on a campus level versus the power of the campus to uh, set its own agenda in response. Uh, who should determine the standards? Should it be people again like us sitting in this room or should there be some other sort of entity that comes up with the standards and the metrics by which they are measured? And finally, what should the balance be between consistency and innovation? And I think this is an important consideration because quality assurance is inherently a conservative act, identifying in advance what are the quality metrics and, and seeing who meets those metrics. There's often not a lot of room for someone to go, I've got different metrics that I want to look on. I've got different ways of accumulating that. But we know, given the realities in higher education today, that we need innovative actors in our systems in order to continue to improve and grow, grow and react to the changing environment we're facing. Um, luckily, there is a, an organization called INPAHI, the uh, International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education, that has gone through the trouble of identifying what are the key characteristics from their perspective, uh, internationally grounded benchmarks for a quality assurance agency. And you can go online and read a lot of detail about these. But these are the 12 areas that they look at. And they involve things like the governance, uh, the financial model, um, the idea of self-evaluation is important. In other words, institutions have to be able and comfortable to be able to, be to look critically at their own activities in order to improve their activities. Um, there needs to be independent judgment. And I think this last one is important. Oops. Um, this, this last one here is important, the idea of international standards, the idea that we're looking at things that aren't just about what's happening locally, but we're benchmarking that against what's happening in other parts of the world to make sure that we're not, we're not nearsighted, we're not myopic in the way that we're looking at education in our own country, in our own context, but taking into consideration the lessons that we might gain in other places as well. Uh, the idea of innovation is my second pillar that I have for this. And this, I say, I've often said that we're the, we're the beneficiaries of a 20-year technological tailwind. And the idea that we do things with technology and with uh, innovative ways of approaching things that simply make what we do so much easier. Um, transportation is so much less expensive in, um, in, in absolute and relative terms than it has been in the past. Communication is essentially free, mobile devices, those sorts of things that we have. Um, we have the ability to harness technology, harness data for decision making, big data and other sorts of ways to be able to make decisions about what we do. Uh, education has unlimited reach and we're really at golden age for internationalization in, in because of what we can do and how far we can reach. You might be familiar with Moore's Law, which says that the power of technology doubles every 18 months 
would suggest that what we can do now is only going to get exponentially greater. But there's another aspect of this called Amara's Law that we tend to we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. So this device that we have right here is 10 years old, right? And how ubiquitous it's become and how much of a, of a connection to our activities that it's been. And we completely unpredicted how this was going to influence the way we talk about it. It's even called a phone, right? How many people use this as a phone for the majority of its actions? It's really this integrated communication and information device but we still call it a phone as if that's the only thing that it does is allow vocal communication like, like uh, the old landlines of, of 30 years ago. So I have a corollary which is the Kinzer corollary which has never been against the technology that we will be able to do things in the future that are virtually unimaginable today and almost impossible for us to even contemplate. Um, but we need to be start planning for the future now and thinking about what the pros and cons are of this future that's coming forward. The idea of how it's going to affect our ability to work between and among cultures, the challenges um, of the virtual experience substituting for the physical experience, uh, thinking about how uh, how it puts us out of our comfort zone that we're able, that we're, we're forced to be in the minority in these sorts of experiences because we're interacting with so much more diversity and the challenges that that faces. There's many, many other ways that we can view and look at this. I think it's important also to acknowledge that this world is further privileging English as a language of communication, which is a privilege for those of us with English as their native language and a disadvantage for those of us with English as not their native language. And I think we need to think a lot about how this universality of communication and this need for a common mode of communication has privileged and prioritized some forms of communication over the other. And what we do in education institutions to think through those questions. So now, on to rankings. This is my third pillar. And again, I think it's the, one of the most important ones to identify a world-class institution. Um, these are a range of uh, uh, rankings, six of them, that I pulled out some of the more prominent ones. There are dozens more. Just go on to Wikipedia and look up global rankings and you know, you'll see just uh, 50 or 60 of these things that are out there in different categorizations and classifications. Um, what I did though is I put in parentheses what the ranking is for Penn State University, Pennsylvania State University, my institution, just to show you the variability. Same institution, same year, but it depends on what these rankings are actually evaluating. There's a big difference between 43 and 93 in terms of what an institutional ranking is. It's, it, it's the ability, I can say that we're a top 100 institution because, because okay, we're seven under on the highest one that's up there. Uh, but if we shifted that um, distribution north a little bit, um, it would look a very different kind of picture about what kind of institution it is. But it's all about the variability within these, within these models. So just to show you, here's, here's what these rankings are actually looking at. These are the rankings <coughs> here. So the academic ranking of world universities has four criteria. Um, it's very heavily weighted towards the sciences and particular types of sciences. So a field medal, a Nobel Prize, publications in nature and science are the key components of it. So this is a very narrow focus on what makes for a high quality institution that they're focusing on here. Even when they say quality of education, it's quality of education that really presumes graduate education and an outcome that is so unusual for institutions that it's hard to hard to make it sound like okay that's you know that's what our that's what our first year students that's what we're aiming for for them all to get field medals at the end it's it's uh, it's a very narrow slice that we're looking at here the Leiden rankings the Leiden rankings are probably the most transparent of them all because they're based on a data set that anybody has access to but again it's primarily about research it's about citations. It's a way about looking at what the impacts are of the citation indicators that have there. They do prioritize what they call these core publications, which all are published in English, and they actually specify they all must be published in English uh, in order to count in their, in their model. They do add something different in here. They add these collaboration indicators, which are represent the geographic diversity and international diversity of the collaborations that occur. The idea is that if you're a prominent institution, your reputation will expand spatially around the world to be able to encompass the kind of work that you're doing. And so it's an important component of, of this indicator. Um, the QS 
rankings uh, has academic reputation and employer reputation of academics. It represents 50% of the ranking is this reputation measure. These are proprietary surveys. Uh, I get one just about every year asking me to rank universities around the world. And I always think to myself, well, what do I know about their quality? I know their name, but I, I, I don't know what their quality is. Uh, but the assumption is that those of us like me who have some small portion of knowledge that we're working on over the thousands and thousands of reviews that come in will average out into these reputation surveys, which represents 50% of the ranking associated with it. They also have citations for faculty, and they continue this idea of having international aspects of it be an important part of the ranking as well. Times Higher Education World University Rankings, we're starting to see a bit of a theme here with the teaching and research component and citations being uh, a key aspect to it. Continuing the international outlook as part of what's important to them. Uh, there's also, if you look at those top boxes under teaching and research, there's reputation surveys there too, which represent about a third of the total. Um, thing. Again, proprietary surveys, reputation, people like me answering surveys about uh, uh, about the uh, survey, and they had this one at the end, uh, industry outcomes, so basically tech transfer kinds of things that come into play. The last one, and I think it's the most recent one that's come forward, is U.S. News and World Report, which got its start in the U.S. ranking U.S. institutions, and is very prominent there for U.S. rankings, has released a, a, a world a best global universities, and again, some of the similar sorts of things that are in there. There's a research reputation, a, re a reputation survey that is again proprietary, representing about 25% of the overall score. Citation index, publications. They continue to do international collaboration as an important aspect of it. And they have this interesting thing where it's like, okay, what percentage of top cited papers are you responsible for as an institution to come into play as well? So we have some themes that we see in these rankings, themes about international collaborations, themes about publication, but not just any publication, publication in very specific sorts of areas, ignoring scholarship, ignoring, excuse me, ignoring teaching, um, and ignoring sort of the, the classroom component of what's being done, um, and thinking about reputation that is being done by surveys as an important aspect of what's going on. So um, if you want to do something about the rankings, you have to pay attention to these indicators, right? You have to understand not just what it is that you're doing, but what it is that you're doing in relation to these indicators. So thinking about those international collaborations that you have, thinking about the publications and where your faculty are being incentivized to publish in, thinking about the English language component of your instruction. If you want to move up the rankings, these are the kinds of things that you would do. And you would do them intentionally. So you would look at this. This is a project that I'm involved with that is a partnership for international research and education. It's based in the sciences, atmospheric sciences. It's a partnership between some US institutions and some institutions in Taiwan, so it's international. It's specifically designed to get publications, science publications, international collaborations, student exchange, joint degree programs, all those kinds of things that these rankings are calling uh, 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 valuable. And it's being done intentionally in order to think through how these kinds of activities might improve the stature of the institutions involved with it. But it also means focusing on the competition. Because remember, if you want to move up, so does everybody else. That means somebody has to move down, right? And you have to look in front of you to see who you want to be better than, and you have to look behind you to see who are the people that are trying to catch up to you. And that's an important component of this. And this is, um, this is a, a, a local example, and I'm not sure how well you can see this here, but this is what I do every year. As I mentioned, my three programs in my department all are ranked in the top 10. So I look at those rankings and say, who's ranked ahead, who's just ahead of me, and who's just behind me? to kind of understand what's my competition if I want to maintain this ranking and think about it very strategically to the point where I'm, where I'm also looking at who are the institutions that are have similar programs across that I do that are also highly ranked because they probably have a profile that's most similar to mine and I ought to be paying particular attention to what those institutions are doing. And in my local case, it is Vanderbilt University and Michigan State University. So if anyone is alumni from there, uh, you're bad at <laughs> uh, We try, so we try to think through this strategically about what we do. We think of it from a strategic planning perspective. 
right? Understanding where we are now, where we want to be, and what do we want to, what do we have to do to get there, right? That's the fundamental um, synergy of a strategic planning model. And to think about it both from a top-down and bottom-up position. So it's easy to think top-down. So the leadership of the institution gets together, you have a strategic planning committee, you identify your goals, your five-year plan, your metrics that you can measure, and then you tell everybody down below you to go do it, right? We've all we've seen these sorts of models take place. That's an important way of thinking about it, but the other way of thinking about it is from a bottom-up perspective. Looking and seeing what are the things that is happening already at your institution that you might not be aware of, but if you bring together into a more coherent model, you can think about them in ways that are work better. That's the Atmospheric Sciences Project that I'm working with now. That was based on a pre-existing collaboration between a person in Taiwan and a person back in the United States that was recognized by the leadership of the university as saying, hey, if we take advantage of this pre-existing relationship, we can have a really good model and build something much more substantial. And so thinking about it in terms of taking advantage of what was already going on within the institution and highlighting, extending, supporting it, providing additional resources in order to make it more prominent. So there's this model of organizational capacity for change that I always like to highlight in talks like this. It's a project that I worked on back in the United States with the National Association of College and University Business Officers. And the idea was they were looking at this and saying, if institutions want to grow and be bigger and better, what are the characteristics that allow them to do it? And in this project, we identified these eight characteristics that were important for building organizational capacity. It, the purpose, the governance, policies, processes, structure, information, infrastructure, and culture. So all of these elements have to be aligned towards these change processes in order to do so. It's not just do you have the money to do it, the financial resources, or do you have the people to do it, the human resources? You also need to have things like the culture in place to do it. Is this a place where people are scared of change or resistant to change, or is it a place where people get excited by the idea of doing something different and new? And that is really something that determines how successful an institution can be in its change initiative, is thinking about it from a cultural perspective. Thinking about the information that you have available to you to inform your decision-making process. If you have policies that need to be reformed in order to allow something new to happen. One of the best ones that I heard of in an international component was the, the Bursar's office, the financial office, didn't have the ability to, to do currency conversion. And so they had to receive all of their money in the local currency because they couldn't receive it in other currencies. And that was, a, that was a restriction that they were facing in order to do something different. So thinking about how those things might come into play are important to put into place. So I'll leave with this. These are key questions, I think, that we should be asking and answering about assessing world-class universities. Um, the first one is, what do you know about what your institution is doing? And really, what do you know? What is the culture of evidence that you're designing this to be supportive of? And I think about this both in a big picture way and in a fine detail sort of way. So just as when you're looking at a building, you have an architectural drawing that sort of shows this is what the building is going to look like. Here's how people are going to use it, the flow patterns and things along those lines. It gives you an idea of how this is going to work. But the building doesn't function unless you also have the engineering drawing associated with it. It shows what all the infrastructure is that supports it, all the electrical wiring, the venting systems, um, all the different aspects of the plumbing and, and supplies that need to happen in order for the building to actually function as intended. Second question is what incentives are in place? And I think about this in a bunch of different ways. Explicit, implicit, encouraging, discouraging, internal, external. Incentives aren't only the ones that you articulate. There are also the incentives that are already embedded within an institution, within an organization, that suggest, encourage, or discourage individuals from doing certain sorts of things. And they also aren't just dependent on what happens within the institution. The institution is part of society, and there are other sorts of incentives that come into play as well about what individuals can and can't do that reflect cultural sensitivities, sensitivities having to do with discipline and the like. What are your relative strengths? Um, in the United States, we have this thing called an elevator pitch, which is if you imagine getting into an elevator on the first floor and you're riding up to the fifth floor with somebody, what do you tell them about your idea or who you are that leaves an impression and has an impact? 
And that's what I think universities ought to be doing and programs ought to be doing. What is that elevator pitch? How do we succinctly describe what we're doing in ways that are going to have meaning and impact on other people? Remember, there are certain things you can control about these um, rankings, right? There are certain things that you have the opportunity to um, change. You can change the publications that you ask faculty to do. You can change the kind of international recruitment that you're doing. But you can't directly change reputation. That someone else has to make a decision to think of you as, some, as differently. But thinking about how you present yourself and promote yourself, that's ways that you can influence the reputation score that somebody else will ultimately give you. Finally, what is your current focus for improvement? And I think this is vital, your current focus. Sometimes we look at all the things that have to be done and we're just completely overwhelmed. I talk with my students when they're first starting out with their dissertation and they're overwhelmed with writing this big, big, huge, doing this whole research project. I say, you don't have to do it all at once. You have to do one thing. And your job is to figure out what the one thing is that you're going to do first and accomplish that and then go to the next one thing. And the job with this sort of improvement is not looking at everything that needs to be done, but identifying what's the first thing that needs to be done and focusing your attention on getting that one thing done. And when that one thing is done, you'll be that much better. So I will leave you with these questions and perhaps we can engage in these areas or other areas that you would uh, like as we move forward. Thank you for your
this card here. What your you are inquiry-based learning, you have passion, responsibility, integrity, diversity, excellence, right? So it's right there on the back of the card. Yes. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, it must be new. I was just handed to it, but I got it on hand. Oh, I've been meaning to make a big announcement of your new mission here. <laughs> Um, but there's different reasons for doing it, and a lot of it is aspirational, right? It's saying this is what we want to be, so let's say that we're doing this now. So my former university was the State University of New York at Albany, and they went through a process of developing a mission, a, a statement, a slogan, a logo, and they came up with the world is the world within reach, right? The world within reach. And I remember thinking, if you know the geography of the United States, Albany in the Northeast, I was Vermont isn't reach, right? So the state right next door, right? If you looked at the enrollment of the institution, we were 95% New York State students in terms of our domestic enrollment, right? So it, it, it was, but it was indicating that this is the direction that we want to go, that we want to broaden our scope, that we don't want to be known as just a New York school, that we're a school that has these kinds of um, more global and national, national and global ambitions associated with it. Um, I'm, I'm curious with respect to one, um, you know, as AUC is part of this as well, I know Penn State is, every university, including, uh, every university wants to pursue this, but they also recognize the strong demand for higher education. Um, but Penn State has other state institutions to absorb that and to take care of maybe the lesser academically prepared or um, other other you know, degree programs that might not contribute necessarily to the, the uh, world class aspiration. Um, in your experience, uh, you know, can universities be successful at both uh, addressing demand and the growing demand for higher education, um, and also be world class? I mean, is it is that possible? Is there a, a huge risk of trying to? Um, tap into those markets or those, uh, those student populations. Right. So as a public university in the state of Pennsylvania, there was just a report that was done last year that looked at the enrollment trends for my campus, which is called the University Park Campus. It's the main campus of the system. Looked at enrollment trends and showed how the enrollment had increased, but the number of students from the state of Pennsylvania stayed the same. So the increase in enrollment came from people outside of Pennsylvania. And that got a lot of attention within the state from a political perspective. Why are we supporting this institution if you're not serving our local students? And so you have to think in both ways. You have to think about what you're doing in terms of serving the local population in ways that are important to your stakeholders, the, the government, the ministry, whoever it is that's setting those kinds of agenda. But at the same time, you need to think about how do we set our marker at a level that allows us to be competitive in other sorts of ways as well. One of the ways that Penn State, my university, does it is we have a very extensive online program that's directed towards making sure that the quality of Pennsylvania State University is available wherever people are. It's called World Campus. Um, despite the name, it really is only focused on the United States. <laughs> this idea of, it's like we have the World Series, but we don't invite any other country to play. Um, uh, it's, an odd system that we have here. But at any rate, the idea is that we use this online format so that people have access to the quality of our institution no matter where they happen to reside. And there are quite substantial incentives within the university to encourage people like me and the programs that I have to participate in it. Our higher education program and our education and leadership program both have very successful online programs that um, allow us to provide this education service much more broadly than we would be if we required everybody to come to Penn State University in the campus. Oh. We were actually going to meet today, uh, but you had to leave earlier. This is the second meeting on IBCs and uh, of us actually going to be with you, uh, but then uh, we had to leave earlier. So I'm going to ask you the question I was going to, to ask you during that meeting, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, we are going to read about IBCs, International Based Campuses. 
And we'd like to hear in particular Berlin on issues of challenges to, such, to having such campuses and best governance practices globally. To think about that. Sure. Um, you're talking about hosting a branch campus yes. here. Yes. Yes. Uh, so there's a couple of things that need to be that we learned need to be in place for this to occur. One of them is a regulatory infrastructure that accounts for the distinctive structures that branch campuses provide. So unlike a domestic campus, a branch campus not only has to meet the regulatory structures of this country, but also the regulatory structures are in place in the home country. And making sure that what you're requiring here are not in conflict with what's being required in the country. There needs to be a relatively stable um, regulatory structure, so there's predictability. These campuses can take at least five years to get off the ground so that they have their own um, stability associated with them and become a sustainable organization. So making sure that you have a system in place that gives these kinds of models a way of taking place. Something much more basic is understanding what your import and export restrictions are. So what does that mean in terms of getting work permits for people to come in and do it? What does it mean for repatriation of resources and revenue? What sort of contracts do you allow in international? Do you require um, a, a local corporation to be the owner of the campus or will you allow foreign ownership in order to come into place? So these are some of the like, really nitty gritty, they're not to do with education, they're more like corporate law kinds of things. Um, and business law that you need to consider with them as well. Um, the final thing is thinking about who you're targeting to bring in and making sure that you have systems in place to bring them in. I once talked to somebody from uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who said they probably get five or six calls a week from people wanting to recruit them to do a branch campus, and they're just not interested in doing it. So thinking about who you're targeting, and ideally looking at people who already have experience doing branch campuses, because they're the ones that are most likely going to think about doing it again, um, and think about what could be in place. You should also think about what natural connections you already have with other institutions. What strong partnerships does Egypt have with other countries around the world that have strong education? systems that you would like to tap into those pre-existing networks. Uh, the example that I have is uh, uh, the uh, Houston Community College had strong connections in Qatar. And they developed a, um, uh, of essentially a branch campus and helped that country develop a community college idea within that nation because of these pre-existing connections that had to do with the oil industry, frankly had to do with, um, there was already um, a, a direct flight from Houston, right? <laughs> that was, that was, you know, the, yes, there was already a direct flight. And so it's like, oh, you know, there was a lot of things that were already in place that um, allowed these things to happen. So thinking broad stands about what it is that you're trying to accomplish and what you already have in place that would do it, and making sure you have plans to make the adjustments necessary to do something different. It's, uh, it is very, very challenging. Um, to be successful in recruiting branch campuses to a country like this, so, yeah. How about two more questions? Well, we are out of the, the question was what kind of challenges are we talking about? We're, we're sort of out of this wild west, which is, I guess, an American term, this idea of, like, you know, everybody wants to go and do it, and everybody's going and, and thinking this can be a, a, a great project to do. And people are doing a lot more due diligence. They're looking a lot more carefully the institutions that are thinking about moving abroad. Um, there's a realization that this is not easy money. This is an investment of resources and time and reputation. And people are very cautious about making those kinds of investments lightly. Um, it used to be the part where people would, like, they make a handshake arrangement because the president of two institutions happened to sit next to each other in the plane on the way home, you know, and then all of a sudden there would be a branch campus. We don't see that anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, we don't see that anymore. Um, we don't see the kind of cold calls that someone just shows up on your doorstep and says, do I have a plan for you? Why don't you open a branch campus in Borneo and have it happen, right? You know, you don't, you don't have those things that are occurring anymore. People are making much more um, strategic decisions about where they're investing their time and energy. Just so you know, we just released a second report with the Observatory for Borderless Higher Education. It came out, I think, two days ago. Um, that looks at branch campuses that have been around for 10 years or more. With the idea of saying, well, what is it that accounts for this sort of um, sustainability and, and relative longevity within the 
field. I think you have some additional ideas along those lines, along with case studies of maybe six or seven of these institutions that we looked at closely. Is it accessible? Um, it's through the observatory. It's accessible. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, I'm going to go back to the question of internationalization. And it's interesting that you brought up uh, the Albany University, New York, uh, New York University in Albany, and the work within reach. I think they're going in that direction because they have a program that is, is uh, collaborating with us, the COIL program. And yes, the yes, yes, yes. So that's a form of internationalization. Uh, and going back again, this may have, uh, you know, uh, may be connected to the, what the campuses or so campuses. One of our challenges is to have students come over um, because of the, let's say, the political situation. And so one uh, a possibility is to do these online or these, uh, you know, these virtual collaborations as much as possible. How much is that, or how is it calculated in the factor that is done in world rankings uh, as, as far as internationalization goes? Yeah, it, it depends on the particular institution in the country and how it calculates its enrollment. So, if they are registered students within the program, so they're, they're paying their tuition fee, they're earning credits, those sorts of things, it, the institution can count them in the numbers that it provides, but they would not be official numbers in terms of the numbers it provides to the federal government in terms of its enrollment. So it depends on what is the source of information that these surveys use in order to gain that. Do they use sort of official, and this is the United States example, recall. Do they use the official government statistics, in which case they almost certainly would not be included, or do they use institutional statistics, which they ought to be included in those? Uh, it, uh, it, uh, the other part of it, though, and let me just go back to what, what I'm saying at the beginning. The idea is to try to develop high-quality programs. If this is a way of developing high-quality programs, the idea that it does or doesn't exactly match the particular circumstances that these rating agencies do is somewhat secondary. You could lobby the ratings agency to change their, their uh, rules. They change them every year, right? And they don't tell you what they're changing them to until they've already changed them. And then you have to go back and figure out okay, what, what's different now from the way it was before. So there's ways that you can say, hey, you ought to be including these students because they're registered students just like anybody else. The fact that they're off campus, offshore, off site shouldn't make a difference in terms of how we're including them in our academic program. I have a quick, it's kind of a rhetorical question because, of course, I'm very anti-rankings and reputational anything. One of the questions that came to my mind is, how much percent of the people who are answering these rankings, who are answering those surveys about reputation, where are they all over the world? And I'm thinking about how, if there is the name of a university in Nigeria, would I differentiate between the University of Nigeria or the Nigerian University or whatever? So thinking about would someone, like Lebanese American University versus American University of Beirut, would someone actually know the difference between these two if they marginally know about them? Right. How many people from our region are answering right. these surveys? Like, okay. if you ask anyone in Egypt, they probably say, see, but, you know. Yeah. Of course. Um, and by the way, if I ever have to answer again, what's the Tell your friend. Tell my friend, right. Um, uh, so, I'll just tell you from my experience what, what actually they send you. They send you an invitation to participate, and that invitation says you should designate what regions of the world you have expertise in, and then what sub-regions you have expertise in, and if there are any disciplines that you have expertise in. And then they then present you with a list that matches what you determine and what you've identified as being your expertise in that area. So I, with some level of integrity, say that my expertise is really only focused on the United States because those are the institutions that I know the best. I mean, I know something about institutions in Malaysia and in China and uh, South Korea, for example, and Brazil to some extent. But, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing more than anything else. And then when I respond to the survey, I list my own institution as the best institution, right? And then I list the institutions that my friends work at as the most best institutions. Because, in all honesty, those are the ones that I know best and that I can say with confidence these are high quality institutions, right? I, I could list um, uh, I could list Michigan, for example, my 
much I do with such a thing. You know, I've been with um, another institution that uh, is uh, perceived to be uh, high value, University of Chicago. I could list the University of Chicago, but I don't know anybody there. And I would only be ranking it because, well, I've heard it's a good place, right? Mm -hmm. And so I try to only identify places that I know, but but because of who I am and who I know, then that then changes the definition of who I might list in these campuses. So I don't know how other people do it, right? But my guess is that other people don't do it that same sort of way. But I say consistently to my dean and my provost, when you have to fill out these surveys, make you number one, no matter what. <laughs> and then anything else can go separate. Yes? Actually, I would obviously the one responsible to provide the data that all people up for the um, they, they send us a template, but we provide the comments. At the end, they go into one pool, not necessarily that the ones we, we provide them will answer for us, but we provide them. Uh, and then, I'm not sure, I'm a bit confused, because what I understand is that you cannot nominate your own institution. You <laughs> US, US, I think you cannot nominate your own institution, and you cannot even send contacts. Yeah. Of people who work in your Right. So uh, you're correct. You can't nominate your own institution for the institutional level survey, but you can do it for the disciplinary. Ah, yes. Uh, for the subject. Yeah, for the subject yeah. level. Yes, thanks. Uh, I have a question about the data. Sure. Uh, it's very tricky what you said because if you remember, we had this discussion whether we should report official data or do we have the luxury to might play in the way. <laughs> or not much play, but put our own definition when we report to the international. We we uh, we thought about things like whether we should include people who have secondary nationality as non as the international. Whether we should include people who, uh, Egyptians who come from international I mean who, who lived abroad and came um, essentially live all their, their life abroad, so they come with the international experience if that's what they're looking for. So my question is, do we have to report official data because this is so far what we're doing? Sorry? Are we Sorry? Uh, again, we, we usually, we all have always reported the official data so far, but now I get the impression that some universities don't really do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I would, I would, I would be surprised if there weren't universities that were um, actively manipulating and even misrepresenting their data in order to influence the responses to these surveys. I'd be surprised if there weren't ones that um, uh, were uh, acting with that lack of integrity. So I'm not suggesting that people. No, no, do that. I'm, I'm saying because you said official, and then um, when Dr. Ida uh, asked about the international. You said, I uh, mean, the online, you said even if they are not counted in the, in the official data, you can count them. I know that that's still not manipulation, it's still correct, it's, right. it's still uh, in, integrity and validity and everything. I'm not saying that we're manipulating in a bad way. But what I'm saying is the difference between official going with official definition, because what when we report official data, we have to go with that definition, right. even if it's not. Doesn't um, correctly represent uh, our. Okay, so part of the challenge is some institutions have a lot of resources that they can devote to looking at these numbers and figuring out. Okay, what are the, what's a more complete way of reporting these? How do we actually think about these in relation to how they're going to be used in different sorts of ways? And making sure that they understand where these numbers come from and how they can be used. I would. I would. Uh, suggest that any university that is thinking about rankings devote some resources to both understanding the impact of what these numbers are and assigning it to an office or an individual with sufficient institutional authority to be able to make some of these kinds of decisions. Uh, in some places, it's it's given to you know the secretary to kind of transcribe the numbers from one place to the other. I think it needs to be at a level that's high enough so that these kinds of fundamental decisions about the institution can be taken into consideration as this, what looks to be maybe a straightforward form is filled out. The international level is just one aspect of it. The definition of international isn't particularly clear in, in a number of different ways. Is it just visa status? 
Um, does it have to do with um, country of origin? Does it, it does, what, what, what is it that it has to do with? Um, naturalized citizens, um, other kinds of refugees, you know, what Especially we, that we get here a lot of women nationalists, mm -hmm. who went abroad, got another nationality and came yeah, back. Dual and national. So for many, many reasons that we don't get into now, mm -hmm. they come here, they prefer to apply an Egyptian. Mm -hmm. But when you go to their second nationality, you find that they have the second nationality. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so again, this and this is also this also comes into play with um, faculty and kind of identifying your international faculty. Mm -hmm. A lot of faculty um, were born abroad, have lived abroad well, but have been living in this country long enough, and in the United States they've gained citizenship because this is where their career and their family and their lives are. And so, do they stop being international because they gain citizenship? You know what? What what is this fine line? What are we actually trying to identify with these with these metrics uh, that we, we talk about? Um, I, I would just emphasize that almost all of these, with I think the exception of the Leiden rankings, are done by private companies, right? They're done by private corporations and they're done as profit-making entities, right? So they are not doing this because they're trying to provide good, unvarnished intellectual material for us to use. They're doing it to sell magazines, right? They're doing it to sell consulting services, right? They're doing it to sell things to you and to us, advertising, all sorts of things that are coming into play here. So I think it's important for universities to realize that you're contributing to their business model, right? And understand what that means in terms of the kind of information that you're providing and what you're doing it for. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you again to the U.S. Embassy Office of Public Affairs. Let's all thank Kevin once again. Thank you.